Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close for The Final Bar. This, uh, this show particularly is going to be a little different. We're going to do an all-mailbag show. Our mailbag is overflowing because of all the fantastic questions you've been sending to us. Please keep them coming. It really helps to uh, see and hear what kind of things you guys are running into as you're trying to use the stock charts platform, trying to use technical analysis to better understand these markets. And I hope these questions echo some of the questions maybe you're having in your own process. But make sure you keep e emailing us your questions. The final bar at stockcharts.com is the best way to get your questions over to us. And here's question number one. Dave, how can I annotate charts for recording trades? Really good question, actually. And this is something um, that I, I always talk about uh, using uh, thinking of charts as a conversation you have with the markets. Right. Um, you know, it, it, uh, I used to think of charts as sort of like a picture. Right. You would sort of have the chart. You'd hang it up on the wall. You wouldn't do anything to it. You wouldn't touch it because it's sort of this pristine image that uh, that isn't meant to be interacted with. Um, but in reality, charts, if you think about how charts charts started, uh, they're paper charts. And the whole point of it was you would draw the charts. And then I know a lot of people, famously, William O'Neill would use the charts as kind of his notebook. He would write all the data points about a company and the industry and the earnings and the ratios and all of that valuations directly on the chart. He actually and he called them data graphs, which is a way of like a, a chart of prices, but with all the other stuff on there, too. And I, I think that's a, a good way to think about it. Don't don't um, you know think of the charts as the conversation you have with the markets, a, a workbook that captures your thinking. And and to be honest with you, my daily chart of the S and P, it's often quite busy. And I actually delete a lot of stuff. I try to before we put it on the air, but still, it's it's pretty busy because every one of these lines was a moment when I was looking and identifying a key level. And for me, tweaking those levels or adjusting them is part of my iterative process of understanding how the markets are changing. And when I have to change key levels, when I have to identify new support or new resistance levels, that is one of those sort of uh, anecdotal signals that the market might be rotating in a particular way. So, how do you actually save those annotations? Let's go back to the chart of uh, home builders. So there's two steps to this on the stock charts platform. Step one is you need a chart list. And step two, you need to start annotating your chart. So it starts with a chart list. And the way that the stock charts platform is designed is basically you have a chart list. You have a list of charts. Instead of having a watch list of tickers, you have a watch list of charts. Because for us, the visual, the chart is what's most important. That's why we're called stock charts and not stock something else, I guess. So the point is that the charts are what's most important. So make a series of charts that have meaning, put them together in a little in a, in a, in a list so then you can refer back to them over time. So two step process to first first stop, uh, first step is to create a chart list. So go to your dashboard. Um, paid members really have the ability to use chart lists in a, in a pretty meaningful way. So really good opportunity uh, for if you if you're not a uh, premium member of stock charts, this is a really good reason to do so. I think this is where the platform really um, can help you make better decisions. In the upper right, there's a little button that says chart list. And if you're just getting started, you might not have many on here, if at all. Uh, but the more you use them, you sort of uh, create more and more lists and eventually you can have hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, you can see I currently have 311. I probably could tighten those up a little bit, but I, I love uh, creating different chart lists at different times. So what you want to do is click on new and give it a title and say create new list. And that'll just give you a, a, a working list. You can see some of the ones like the Mindful Investor Live chart list. This is the three and three. So every day on the show, I have a three and three at the end where I share three charts in three minutes. And I basically have a chart list. And every day I populate this list with the new three charts I'm going to feature on the show. So let's assume that's your watch list and you're looking at ITB. So next step is under here, you want to go to annotate. And then your toolbar on the left pops up here. So things like trend lines, you sort of, uh, you know, it's pretty intuitive. It's all kind of click and drag type of stuff. And I'm not thinking heavily about the lines I'm drawing, just trying to do it for uh, demonstration purposes. Notes are really good for I made a trade here. And you can kind of move it around. You can make the fonts a little bigger if you want. Uh, and I did not. That is no recommendation there. I'm just using this for hypothetical purposes. Callout is also a, kind of an interesting one. Here's a callout. 
You can see how that looks a little bit different. It's more of like a little uh, separate box on there. It's more of a preference. I tend to use these annotations because I, I like how they look better, but uh, totally up to you. We have arrows and all sorts of different notational tools and also things like percent change and stuff. And these sort of tools just really help you understand what's happening. At the end, just click on the little X. It's going to say, do you want to save it? You say, heck yes. Give the uh, chart a title. And it doesn't, it can, it defaults to just the ticker and the name of what you're looking at just to give you something, but you can call it whatever you want. And then just select your chart list uh, from the bottom and say upload. And that'll save that chart onto your, uh, into your list. And what's cool is those chart lists update real time, right? So every time you bring up that chart list, um, you'll see the, the, uh, the newer information. So it's not taking a snapshot of a moment in time. It's a live chart. It's sort of a group of live charts that will continue to update. So this is great for really having like a watch list. Here are some stocks that I'm looking at. Uh, and then you can refer back to that and see what's happened after those moments that you put them on there. But that's how you put annotations in there. I actually have chart lists for different brokerage accounts and retirement accounts that I manage. Uh, and I save a chart with annotations for any trade that I put in there so I can remember what I picked, when, and why. Hope that answers your question. Next question, why is an inverted hammer a reversal signal? And uh, earlier this week, we highlighted the example of AT&T, and I mentioned this uh, inverted hammer. We're going to zoom in a little bit. This is called, uh, I call this a candle focus chart, and this is this one right here. And what I highlighted was this inverted hammer usually uh, indicates a short-term reversal. And, uh, you know, as a reminder, an inverted hammer is when the open and close are at the lower end of the range. You have minimal lower shadow and a long upper shadow. So what happened, think about what the day looks like, kind of looks like an inverted V, kind of. You open at the lows, you trade higher, but at the close, you go right down to the lows. Um, the question is, why is that a reversal candle? And I, and, and you you put a little more detail in there that you thought, you know, this is a candle that's actually going, you know, it's going down and it's closing at the lows. Isn't that still bearish? Why is that a bullish uh, sign, a reversal sign? You can see on AT&T, it actually worked pretty well because the next couple of days, gap higher and uh, continue to move to the upside. So what gives? So, you know, hammer candles really play off the idea of a doji candle, which is like this one right here. A doji is where the open and close are even, right? So the open, you trade around, and then the close is right at the same point. And a doji candle represents indecision. It looks like a little cross because when you have a trend and then you have that candle, it means even though you've been going higher, for example, the open to the close, you didn't make any further progress, right? So instead of continuing to show additional demand and closing well above the open, you're actually closing back at the open. And that usually indicates indecision because whatever buying power got you to that point has sort of alleviated because now we're not pushing any further. A doji candle at a bottom tells you the same thing. It tells you indecision. So we're going down instead of making a new low, you're closing back at the open. So something has changed. I think the logic of the hammer and the inverted hammer are the same. So a hammer would be if the open and close are at the top, and then you have a big lower shadow, an inverted hammer, the open and close are at the bottom. The, the kicker is, and I guess the way I think of it, is instead of having a big down day like the day right before that, we had this inverted hammer. So think of you know a big down day, another big down day. We open here and trade much higher close back at the lows, but we didn't make a big down day again, right? So instead of making lower, lower, lower lows, all of a sudden we're kind of coming right back to that point. So instead of pushing way lower, we're actually finding support at the open. And that's the logic of it. It really plays on indecision. And the key with this pattern is that the open and close are very, very close. And it represents the fact that whatever catalyst got us to this point, are probably alleviated. So that's why inverted uh, or regular hammers at a top, it would be called a shooting star or a hanging man candle. All of those are reversal candles because the open and close are at a very close level. I hope that makes sense. And that's why. Next question. If mega cap growth struggles here, would you rotate into stocks with new scooter highs? And I still love that that's how you're asking that question to think about, uh, you know, whether you want to rotate into, um, into stocks with strong scooter rankings. Um, so you're basically, I think, in your question, just talking about the fact that, uh, you know, if we look at the Qs, for example, the Qs have had a pretty impressive run, no doubt, in 2023. I mean, what an incredible move to the upside, uh, outperforming the S&P because the mega cap growth stocks that are the biggest weights in the NASDAQ 100 are really driving uh, most of the gains in 2023, arguably. 
Now, that's starting to change a little bit. And we've highlighted on our show things like industrials making new swing highs. When I talked to Marianne Bartels, we talked a lot about industrials, uh, you know, looking more attractive. Um, energy stocks bouncing off of lows. Financials breaking out. Stocks like JPM uh, kind of uh, breaking out of a basing pattern. Uh, some material stocks even starting to improve. These are more value-oriented names that have been not participating as much in the uptrend of 2023, but now all starting to participate um, you know, so I would agree with the fact that mega cap growth has certainly had an incredible run. It's the, those names are overextended by pretty much any classic definition, I would think, uh, you know, whether you're looking at overbought, oversold conditions or whether you're looking at, um, you know, um, any sort of price momentum, just where we're at relative to key resistance levels sort of get that sense that they've already had a pretty, uh, pretty incredible run. Uh, so if they rotate lower, if growth struggles, What would you do? And so I think, to be honest with you, my answer would be it depends on the charts. I can't I can't really know what's going to happen. I think one of two things happens in that environment. Right. So the mega cap, things like Microsoft and Apple, those names that have really been driving things higher. Let's say they stall out and rotate lower. That's going to put a lot of pressure on our growth oriented benchmark. So I would say no matter what the S&P and the Nasdaq, if the meta and Apple Microsoft trade starts to roll over, Amazon and others, the benchmarks are going to come down because there's such a big weight. The question is, do those other areas like industrials and materials and energy and financials step in and take the place of those names or do they struggle as well? I would I'm I'm going to assume that the that the former is probably more likely. Uh, and and I will tell you one of the one of the charts we highlighted in our 3 and 3 recently was Abvi Abby's a biotechnology name actually showing a bullish momentum divergence. So lower lows, uh, you know, in June, higher lows in RSI and breaking higher. So, you know, I, I could see a scenario where uh, something like uh, like like biotech healthcare or, um, you know, industrials, materials start to do pretty well. The kicker is our benchmarks will probably struggle in that environment. But look at the first half of 2022 when the markets were down, but energy was ripping to the upside. Materials were doing very well. Those sectors just don't have enough weight to push the benchmarks up, but there can be really good places to be in the equity space. I think the charts will tell us what we want to own. I'm going to want to own charts that are going up and then I see as likely to continue to go up. And and so that's how I would probably want to answer it. Here's the problem, though. Something like Ad the really starting to show an attractive bounce off the lows is still very low on the scooter rankings. One of the benefits of the scooter rankings, it's a little more longer term. So it, it has three time frames: long term, medium term, short term. I think it's 60% weighting on the long term. I think about 30% on the medium term and only 10% on the short term. So the kicker is uh, these stocks that have had really good runs, if they start to rotate lower, the scooter rankings are not designed to be super sensitive and to just downgrade those names just because they pull back a little bit. It's actually meant to stay with things as long as the longer term trends are, uh, are in place. So I don't know if a, bit, a high scooter ranking is going to be a good move. An improvement in the scooter ranking could be a really interesting thing to look at because those are things that are probably, you know, not doing well, but maybe really starting to improve. I still think other tools than the scooter ranking might be better early on. I think these will more reflect over time uh, how that how that thing has evolved. But by uh, by the way, if you want to know that, go to charts and tools, go to scooter reports, and then whatever uh, universe you want to do, do change. So this is going to be stocks that have had the biggest move higher in their scooter rankings just intraday. You can also say one week. So you can say for the last week, which stocks have had the biggest improvement in their scooter rankings. That might be the list I would look for. Great question, by the way. Next one, Dave, what indicator do you use to get out of a position when a trend is over? And you actually gave me some choices, like a poll question. So thanks for that. You said... Uh, closing price breaks a strategic moving average. Closing price breaks a trend line that was connecting the recent lows, a parabolic SAR signal or a chandelier exit. So, you know, to be honest with you, I don't know if I would say that there is necessarily a bad answer out of those four. I think all four of those could have merit. Um, and to be honest with you, uh, I this may be a controversial comment to make because some people are very fanatical about particular things. They will say the SAR, the parabolic SAR is the answer. And if you use anything else, you're, you're shortchanging yourself. I have come of the opinion over, over the years that there are a number of different ways. There, there are differences between each of those options that you mentioned, but they are all meant 
to keep you in positions that are working and to get you out of positions that are not working. And all the differences between them are just subtle differences, whether you're basing it on average true range or some sort of lagging indicator or some sort of trend line or some sort of moving average. But they're all trying to help you be a better money, have a better money management solution um, for when things really uh, start to go awry, when, when a trade starts to go against you. So I think using any of them is a really good option uh, versus doing nothing. I will say that. Which is the best one? I think that depends quite a bit in terms of your time frame, in terms of what sort of game you're trying to play. Um, in practice, I mean, if you would if you would look at you know my understanding of the statistical analysis, any sort of studies I've seen, something like the chandelier exit is usually the most optimal because it's based on average true range. And what that means is the more volatile the stock, the wider the stop, the less volatile, the tighter the stop. And parabolic SAR does that to a degree, but the uh, chandelier exit is really meant to optimize for that. It's really designed as a trailing stop system. So if I had to pick one, I would probably do the chandelier exit uh, for an active trade that I'm that I'm that I have on. Um, in terms of what I use in practice, I often use uh, moving averages, and I use the 50-day simple moving average. Uh, and and the simple the simple reason is because it is easy to understand. It is you know very uh, familiar to most people, and just recognizing when the price goes below there that something may be changing that you need to take action on, I think is more meaningful than anything. So I, I would argue my, the, the best answer is one of those uh, versus none is a vast improvement. Having a good money management process is better than not having one. And having a consistent money management process that is not perfect is still a pretty good option. Um, you know, trying to optimize it over time is really good. And I would encourage you, uh, everyone, to, to experiment with the different ones. And you will tend to find with technical indicators, the way you find the charts and indicators that work for you is you use them and the things that work, you use them more and the things that don't work, you stop using them. So maybe experiment with uh, different uh, stop ideas and, and see which ones work uh, for you in your process. That's my answer. Next question. Is there a way to scan for Heiken Ashi candles? Really interesting question. And uh, I don't mean to show ITB is the only stock on the planet. So we'll look at uh, Home Depot here. Heiken Ashi candles are, are very um, underused and undervalued. This is a uh, Japanese form of uh, a, really an adaptation of candlestick analysis. Um, if you if you're familiar with candlestick analysis, Heiken Ashi candles will look very uh, familiar because it uses the same visualization. It just calculates the candles a little bit differently, and it does it to smooth out the candles over time. And there are a series of charts, uh, Japanese charting styles like Heiken Ashi, like Renko charts, that are all you know essentially I, I would argue attempts to improve traditional candlestick charts. And, and, and if you want to understand more details about what these are, uh, click on the little magnifying glass and type Heiken Ashi and you'll uh, get a chart school article that explains the methodology, explains the calculation, how it you know adjusts the data to make them a little more smooth and some of the you know sort of tips and tricks. And I think one of the real benefits of the, of the Heiken Ashi candles uh, system is that when a chart is in a pretty good uptrend, you just have all of these uh, white candles. Uh, in a normal candle chart, you'll have black candles along the way because you'll have these down days. But Heiken Ashi candles actually adapt for that. And as long as the trend is still up, it's more like a point and figure chart, which kind of keeps showing um, uh, open candles or, or hollow candles. As a result, it just makes uptrends and downtrends very clear. It's really obvious when a trend has shifted. And that's when I think one of the great benefits. It affects all the technical indicators. So a lot of technical indicators calculated off of uh, Heiken Ashi uh, charts can be very different. They're subtly different, uh, but they can be different. And so just be aware uh, aware of that. Short answer to your question, uh, do we have a way to scan for them? No. Um, would I love to incorporate that in our new scanning engine? Absolutely. That is on the development queue. As you pro hopefully have seen in the last 12 to 18 months, uh, stock charts, we have really uh, redesigned our development process. We're going with phased releases uh, and the whole release model. Uh, we'd sort of done piecemeal improvements to the platform when we when we needed. Um, now we're actually doing more formal releases. It's really improving how we are developing new features, how we're testing them, and how we're prioritizing them. So things like this that you're looking for that we can't do yet, I appreciate the, the question. I would encourage you to send a note to our support test because we, we literally look at how many requests we get for different features and that's what helps us prioritize them. So if something like this scanning for a particular thing, whether it's a Heiken Ashi candle or fundamental data or options or whatever it is that you think uh, we, we, we need to have, 
um, please click on uh, help in the upper right. Send a note to our support desk with what you think we need. Um, we, we, cat it, we, we list and, and capture all of those and then use the number of requests as part of the prioritization process. So thanks for that question um, and, uh, and I appreciate it. Next question, Dave, why don't you use volume on your charts? Shame on you. I added that last part uh, on my own. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I, so obviously I show a ton of charts on, uh, on the final bar and in my work, and I rarely, if ever, put volume on there. And that is, that is just how my own toolkit has evolved. When I was first learning technical analysis in the early 2000s, I was taught that volume was essential. And particularly if you read some of the old, older texts like the Edwards and McGee book, and they talk about patterns, um, volume is actually a really important component of those patterns. As a matter of fact, they even say that unless volume has a certain, you know, uh, characteristic through the pattern, it's not a valid pattern. Um, and that's how important it was. Now, having said that, I think those books were written uh, originally at a time when volume meant something different than it does today. Back then, stocks were traded on eights and they were traded at a physical post on the floor of an exchange. And you had one source of that data and you could track buys and sells and track up ticks and down ticks and measure volume and understand that a move with big volume meant a directional bet by a big institution. That's just kind of how that would happen in, in you know, 50 years ago. Now in 2023, I don't think it's the case. You have dark pools. You have a lot of different electronic means of trading. You have a lot of um, you know, big firms trying to break their trades down. You have smaller investors that are able to trade on decent volume and everything in between. So I think the idea of volume and, and then you have a lot of volume that is more, you know, high frequency trading, more hedge fund trading, uh, more offsetting option positions and all of that. And so the idea that a stock move on with a certain type of volume means something. I don't know if I could uh, if I would agree that that is as clear of a signal as it might have been 50 years ago. So is volume obsolete? I don't think so. I think it still has value. I just I've, I've found that not having volume on the chart doesn't really prohibit me from identifying breakouts and identifying trends. I have not found volume to be a huge differentiator. If I did use volume, and I do occasionally, I would not use just the regular volume uh, inputs because I think that's an overly simplistic way of thinking about volume. I would much rather use something like on balance volume and even better improvements would be things like accumulation distribution, check in money flow. I think those are really good ways of thinking about volume and their relationship to price and how that's changing over time. So something like accumulation distribution, check in money flow, those would be the two that I would point you to. Um, some of our stock charts contributors like Tom Boley comes to mind, often uses the accumulation distribution indicators. So maybe check out uh, his shows and his articles if you're looking for ideas about how to apply that in individual stocks and ideas. Uh, but that's why I don't use volume. I think that the, the way that volume, what volume means, I think has changed to the point that I don't think looking at a daily volume reading is going to add a lot in my own process. I'm not saying it doesn't have value, but for me, I found um, I don't necessarily feel like I need it. Um, if I was using volume, which I do occasionally, I, I use accumulation distribution and shake and money flow because they actually look at volume trends over time. That's more important to me. Dave, what's the trick to show only the histogram on the MACD and PPO? We're getting in the weeds with that technical question. And I'll show you, let's see. So if you look at MACD, so this is the uh, MACD indicator you can see here, right? So you see MACD and you see the uh, MACD indicator, which is the MACD line in black, the signal line in red, and then the histogram is in blue. And the histogram is basically just showing you the difference between these two lines. So it's meant really, it was originally meant to complement the MACD indicator. You can get this information based on you know, looking at the two lines. Um, so when the MACD histogram crosses zero, that means that the two lines are crossing. So it's just a great visual cue. And it's almost like a momentum indicator based on uh, based on the, um, uh, the, 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 the two lines, right, based on the MACD indicator. So an example would be like in July, you can see that uh, UNH kind of spiked higher. It's still a buy signal because the MACD line hasn't crossed down, but you see how the histogram went higher and then started to slope lower. And that told you that that initial upswing was probably taking a break. Same thing here, like in October of 2022, price is going higher, MACD signal uh, and the buy signal is going up. 
you see the histogram going up, going up, going up, starting to go down. The histogram actually often turns at the peak. You can see that here in April of this year as well, right? Price is going higher. The MACD histogram is sloping higher. It starts to slope down, which tells you the trend is slowing down. Really, the top is most likely in. The MACD sell signal is the confirmation after the top telling you it's in there. So it's a good leading indicator for MACD, which is why a lot of people uh, like to have it. Now, you could just use it. And it's kind of like turning MACD into an RSI. The way we do that on our platform is we have a separate indicator called MACD histogram. And that just breaks the histogram out as its own indicator. So that's what I would use if you want to get that. And again, what it what it's basically doing is turning MACD into more of an oscillator. Uh, it'll look very similar to an RSI in terms of how it how it does, except it rotates around the zero line. And what you're looking for is basically when the MACD uh, histogram is going uh, is uh, going positive and increasing. It tells you the trend is up. When it starts sloping down, that is usually an early warning that things may be reversing. And again, waiting for that validation of a MACD sell signal is often a pretty good uh, way of confirming that downside rotation. Dave, what are your thoughts on uranium stocks? Uh, we haven't talked about uranium stocks in, uh, in quite some time, to be honest with you. Um, CCJ is a particular name that you asked about, uh, among, uh, among others. Uh, URA is another one. Uh, I think that's the ETA, the uranium ETF. So, you know, um, you know, so this first chart in particular, CCJ, I, I, it's actually a pretty, pretty good chart. And, and I don't know if I will, I will generalize to all uranium, but I will, I will say this particular name uh, here um, definitely came up on a scan uh, that I ran uh, earlier this week for stocks making new three month highs. And that is a group of uh, that's a scan that I run regularly just to look for stocks breaking out and breaking down, not necessarily new all time highs, but just starting to begin that process of, uh, of upside rotation. You're seeing that now with CCJ getting above, uh, you know, this uh, sort of uh, resistance level in February, just below 30. We see we broke above 30 and pull back and then rotate it higher. I think that's a really strong setup. I think holding 30, holding the 50 day moving average would be pretty important to that trade because as long as that holds, that tells you the trend is improving from here. We break that and I would question the trend, but for now, uh, not a bad chart. The uranium ETF, less, less attractive and, and you probably can guess why if you follow the show. I see this is still in a basing pattern, right? So I think of uranium, I think of any uh, chart as at any point in one of three phases. An accumulation phase means it's going up, a distribution phase means it's going down, or a consolidation phase, it's going sideways. And any chart you can categorize as one of those three at any point. I still see URA as being in the consolidation phase. We have clear resistance and clear support. We've consistently shown that we don't get above resistance and we don't get below support. And until that changes, I'm much, I'm pretty hesitant to take a, a significant bet here. I'd much rather go elsewhere where there's an actionable move, something like, uh, you know, the biotech stock that we mentioned earlier, rotating to the upside. I think those sorts of opportunities are more actionable than something like this, which is not broken out yet. Final question for the day here. Could the S&P be making a giant double top? Simple answer is sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It could. Um, you know, is it actually going to make a double top? Let me look at the chart of the S&P and I will try to make it a little cleaner for you. And uh, that didn't make too much of a difference, did it? And we're going to go back a couple years here. So I got a lot of annotations on my, uh, on my chart. Let me do this. We'll go here. I'll make this a really clean chart. And then we'll go back uh, like three years to kind of show this. So I think what you're asking about is, you know, here's the big run higher uh, off of 2020. Let's bring in a little more data. So now we can get the 2020 low. Here's the big move up to the high at the end of 21. We had the sell off into the October 2022 low. And now this big rotation higher that just keeps going. Could this be a huge double top? We uh, top out around 4,800 and then rotate lower. Absolutely. And and what's interesting is if you look at a bunch of charts besides some of those leading names that I think are more of an exception that have just blown to new all time highs. A lot of stocks are not at all time highs yet. A lot of stocks are still below their all time high. And I would argue that is a monster resistance level. The question I would be asking myself is what's the optimism that we had at the end of 2021? Right? What were the reasons why the bull market phase was going so well? What changed in 2022? And can you honestly say now things are all better and to the point that we should be valuing stocks at the same point we were at the end of 21? I don't know if I would be able to say that. I think, uh, you know, the argument against the market going much higher from here is, 
Right? We're arguably in a recessionary period. The economy is slowing down and the market is moving higher because of optimism of an easy recovery and the promise of AI and that growth stocks, in some cases, not making any money are the key to the future. And I've seen that before. It did not end well when we've had other, uh, you know, other bubble like environments where where there's a an, an optimism about a future valuation of technology that really isn't a good, uh, you know, necessarily a, a, an actionable business today. And it's not a profitable business yet. I think that's what you're seeing with AI. And so I, I see a lot of behavioral characteristics of the last six months that are very bubble-like. And, and I'm looking at, you know, reading, rereading Irrational Exuberance. You'll find a lot of rhyming to what you he- hear and see today versus what you've seen in pre- the left side of previous bubbles. The reality is, though, those trends can persist for quite some time. I am very skeptical of the market going anywhere above 4,800 and sustaining that. I just I don't see that given the macro environment that we're in. Having said that, do I think we're going to have a double top versus do we actually have a double top? Those are two different questions. Do I think we're going to have a double top? Probably. I, I, I don't see us getting above uh, the, the 2022 high yet. Um, do we have a big pullback and then a break to new highs into year end around 5,000? Maybe. Do we go and retest the October 2022 lows? Maybe. There's a big difference between what we think could happen, sort of that probabilistic analysis versus respecting what is happening. And for now, as long as the market keeps going higher and as long as prices keep making higher highs and higher lows, I'm going to assume that that trend is going to persist until proven otherwise. So I am focused on signs of a change of character, and I would encourage you to do the same. Folks, that's it. That's a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for The Final Bar. Really appreciate all of your fantastic questions. Keep them coming. The Final Bar at StockCharts.com is the best way to get your emails our way. Go to StockCharts.com slash special for information on our current summer special. For StockCharts.com, I'm Redmond Washington. I'm Dave Keller. Be well. Stay safe. Have a good one.